Uh, I'll be working from uh, two different uh, machines here, so bear with me and bear with me, bear with my voice, which is a little faint. I lost it earlier this week for a couple of days. Um, I think it's back. And uh, as as uh, Wim mentioned, I'll be talking about um, architectural criticism. Really, that's the title. Architectural discourse is uh, a bit of a placeholder. Um, he asked me, um, as he mentioned, drawing from the Reading LA series that I did in the LA Times um, in 2011 um, to talk about the history of architectural criticism in this city. Um, and I want to thank uh, him for the invitation to do so and thank Christopher Alexander and um, others at the GRI for the chance to be here this morning um, this, and, and take part in this really terrific Symposium. So uh, we'll be covering a fair amount of ground in these 45 minutes. Um, uh, and I think if we're talking about uh, criticism and the idea and ideals of architecture um, in, and the built environment um, in Los Angeles and Southern California, it makes sense to um, go back as far as the 1880s and the publication of Helen Hunt Jackson's um, novel Ramona, and it was really that novel and then the associated pageants connected to it that really began to create some of the hardiest uh, myths about um, the uh, culture, climate, and built environment in, uh, in Southern California. A couple of caveats as we uh, begin this morning. Um, what I will be um, presenting is not a study of scholarly um, work on Los Angeles architecture, uh, nor of architectural history, and I leave that to Tony, who will will follow with a talk on Rainer Banham. It's really, as I mentioned, a survey of architectural criticism as it emerged here, and and written work that aimed for a public audience for the most part and reached outside the academy. Um, and the point I think is really to suggest that there has been in architecture writing in Los Angeles, um, uh, this kind of push and pull between boosterism and frank, even jaundiced assessments um, between optimism about this place and a really deep um, cynicism. Um, and it's really that optimism uh, and that sort of uh, boosterism that takes us back to Ramona um, and in fact the um, effect that it had on um, our perception of, um, of the missions and the kind of founding architecture as it began, began to be understood of Southern California, um, symbols of uh, ultimately a kind of idyllic um, uh, and, and sun-washed um, past, um, which also included um, uh, this kind of treatment, um, uh, this kind of salesmanship about the climate and about products of Southern California, um, like our oranges. Um, but even as early as, um, as the 1920s, um, with the publication of Louis Adamich's The Truth About Los Angeles, we begin to see books aiming to counter uh, the hype and salesmanship propelling LA's really substantial growth. Um, and Adamic was a, a Croatian immigrant, um, uh, came to San Pedro as a teenager, became a journalist and later a historian of the labor movement. Um, and this pamphlet of a book, and really that's all it is, is a pamphlet um, uh, written as part of Emanuel Haldeman Julius's Little Blue Book series. For those of you who are not familiar with Haldeman Julius, he was based in Kansas and he um, he, uh, inspired by um, the publication of paperbacks, um, wanted to produce these books that, uh, that working men and women could carry in their shirt pockets. Um, and uh, number 647 in that quite prolific series was Adamich's um, Truth About Los Angeles, which is really the first example of this kind of frank um, attempt to, to cut through some of that hype and boosterism. Uh, in writing about Los Angeles, he, he calls it a young city, crude, wildly ambitious, growing. He also says, uh, he also writes, Los Angeles has been referred to as a city, but it is actually only a huge exaggerated village, an Iowa or Kansas small town suddenly multiplied by 500, and some of its main street buildings grown 12 stories high. Um, and he 
uh, talked about um, a, a number of subjects in that book, but he did he did talk about architecture explicitly in a couple um, uh, of moments. Um, and uh, the tallest building in the city at the time he was writing, it was actually under construction, um, um, was the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Uh, its headquarters at 6th and Hope Street downtown. Um, um, and he described the building as a veritable stronghold of divine truth, vast and invincible. Its soldiers, male and female, ever on guard, ever eager to face the devil and his forces and give them battle. Um, and as opposed to the imposing and starched formality of that building, um, since demolished, um, Adamish discovers a certain rough around the edges poetry in Southern California's low rise vernacular and retail architecture. Um, around the plaza, for example, he finds what he calls the most interesting part of Los Angeles, a parade of, quote, dance halls, forlorn looking hotels, bootleg dives, hop joints, movie shows, tamale stands, peep shows, shooting galleries, and stores selling rosaries and holy pictures. And he's in essence setting up a dichotomy that continues to this day in writing about Los Angeles and its architecture with critics often traveling to see the architectural monuments of present day Bunker Hill, but finding more life architectural and otherwise at the bottom of the hill on Broadway and other streets. Um, he also found um, uh, buildings and uh, architecture to like in Long Beach where he became fascinated with, quote, a stretch of beach with huge hotels and a mammoth cafeteria, hot dog stands, popcorn machines, merry-go-rounds, fortune, teller, fortune tellers, booths, sideshows, peep shows, leg shows, and freak shows, dance halls, penny arcades, and curio shops, and a long pier extending several hundred yards into the sea. Um, his book is followed in something of the same vein um, uh, six years later in 1933 with Moro Mayo's book uh, simply titled Los Angeles. Um, Mayo was an itinerant journalist born in Kentucky. He lived in Southern California from 1925 to 1931, writing uh, for the Pasadena Star News and occasionally for the LA Times. And he, like Adamich, casts a jaundiced eye on a self-promoting city, which he calls, quote, a huge country village. Um, and he also begins this critique of boosterism in LA, writing, the attitude of Angelinos towards their city is precisely that of a salesman toward his product, or a football cheering section towards its team. Here is a spirit of boost. I love that line, a spirit of boost, uh, which has become a fetish, an obsession, a mania. Everything else is secondary to it. He also describes a newly uh, arrived citizenry largely detached from public life, a detachment that continues as the recent mayoral election has made clear to be a characteristic element of life in Los Angeles. The newcomers, Mayo writes, arriving in paradise as a result of the Chamber of Commerce ballyhoo were not interested in unions or the times or in any capital labor fight. They were interested in real estate, in thawing out, in growing oranges at a profit of $1,000 an acre, in getting ahead in this new country. And yet, like Adamich, Mayo really admires the ad hoc retail architecture of Los Angeles, its informality and energy, almost in spite of himself. And the book includes a two-page photo spread um, anticipating figures like Ed Ruscha and, and, uh, and Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown showing um, some of the bizarre restaurants and refreshment stands, as he put it, which delight the eye and tickle the palate of visitors to Los Angeles. And that spread includes buildings um, shaped like a tamale, an igloo, an owl, and a giant boot. Um, and the locals uh, were not always um, so happy with these kinds of takes. This is a, a headline from the Times. Um, the word larept means uh, to be thrashed or whipped, by the way. Um, was not a word that I knew. Um, and, and that sort of um, um, uh, response uh, and, and even um, backlash from the locals um, continues to be a theme in uh, the sort of give and take between critics and um, their readers in Los Angeles. Um, and around um, 
uh, this same time we, we, we reach what is perhaps the first sustained uh, meditation on the landscape and built environment, um, although one written in German and uh, the only translation um, even today it, uh, is right here at the, at the GRI. Um, uh, this book, um, Los Angeles, by the German geographer Anton Wagner, which becomes an influence on Rainer Banham, its title translated as Los Angeles, the development, life, and form of the Southern California metropolis. Um, it looks with some fascination at Los Angeles as essentially a new breed of city, and of course we'll see um, that take reappearing um, later, but I think importantly a city deserving of its own uh, scholarship and deserving to be um, understood on um, its own terms. And it's probably worth um, pausing to at least briefly acknowledge the tradition of criticism of LA and its built environment that was bubbling up in fiction about Los Angeles of this era as well, if only to make room for one of what I think is the great uh, world-weary book titles about uh, Los Angeles, Turn Off the Sunshine, um, by Timothy Turner, um, as well as mentioning uh, Faulkner's uh, 1935 short story, Golden Land, which was first published in Mencken's um, American Mercury. Um, in which the narrator lives in a Spanish-style house in, quote, a select residential section of Beverly Hills, and uh, which contains one of the great descriptions of light in Los Angeles. I'm quoting from the story. The sun, strained by the vague, high, soft, almost nebulous California haze, fell upon the terrace with a kind of treacherous unbrightness. The terrace, the sun-drenched terracotta tiles, budded into a rough and savage sheer of canyon wall, bare yet without dust, on or against which a solid mat of flowers bloomed in fierce, lush, myriad-colored paradox, as though in place of being rooted into and drawing from the soil, they lived upon air alone and had been merely leaned intact against the, the sustenance-less lava wall by someone who would later return and take them away. That's from Faulkner's Golden Land. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, it, would, it, it would be a mistake not to mention Nathaniel West's great uh, novel, Day of the Locust from 1939, a story of the LA dream really coming apart at the seams, um, but really stor a story also full of um, what I think continue to be unrivaled descriptions of LA's polyglot residential architecture um, as West writes in his description of the um, of, of hillside architecture, but not even the soft wash of dusk could help the houses. Only dynamite would be of any use against the Mexican ranch houses, Samoan huts, Mediterranean villas, Egyptian and Japanese temples, Swiss chalets, Tudor cottages, and every possible combination of these styles that lines the slopes of the canyon. Um, in this same period, in the 1920s and into the 1930s, um, is when we begin to see the first coverage in the popular press of Los Angeles' growing stock of modernist architecture. And a good uh, deal of that coverage in this period was written by Pauline Gibling Schindler, who married Rudolf Schindler in 1919, and by the 1920s was beginning to write about the work of her husband and Richard, Richard Neutra and others, while also running something of a salon from the Schindler House on King's Road. Um, and yet, it wasn't until after World War II with the 1946 publication of Carrie McWilliams' Southern California Country, an island on the land, actually in the land in the original title, now known as Southern California, an island on the land, that Los Angeles and its emerging culture and built environment get a really proper treatment. And um, one of the, the real um, uh, lessons and surprises for me of the Reading LA Project was indeed how well this book um, holds up in all kinds of ways. Um, not least, I think, appropriate given the film that we just saw, um, not least for the extent to which um, uh, McWilliams really uh, recognized the, the talent and importance of Irving Gill, um, whom he saw as fighting an important fight against what he called, McWilliams called, the city's ever-spreading 
stucco rash. Um, he praises Gill's work with its spare, nearly platonic geometries for the way it rebelled against, quote, all, um, all ornament, cheap construction, and false effect. Um, and Gill's buildings really suggested for McWilliams a path, I think, toward an authentic um, Southern California architecture and indeed um, culture. Um, and as an aside, I, I haven't seen the abstraction, inventing abstraction show that's at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but from what, from what I can gather from the catalog, Gill is not included in that show. It seems to be um, a real pity, um, uh, which continues a sense of his work, I think, being under-recognized as being a kind of precursor for what we think of as the purest kind of European modernism in some ways. Um, so it's around this the same time, the immediate post-war period, that um, Esther McCoy, uh, a magazine journalist and uh, a fiction writer um, uh, of some achievement um, who had worked during the war as a draftswoman in Schindler's uh, studio, begins turning in earnest to architecture writing and architecture criticism. Um, and by 1950, she's writing for Architectural Record and Architectural Forum, um, among many other uh, uh, publications. Um, and it's in, in 1960 that her breakthrough book, Five California Architects, is published. Um, uh, the catalog for the exhibition, Roots of California Contemporary Architecture, at bottom right there, follows in 19, um, uh, sorry, precedes that in 1956, um, followed by books on Craig Elwood later on and the, and the roots of Schindler and Neutra's work uh, in, in Los Angeles, um, among uh, many other titles, and if McWilliams remains important for, um, for suggesting uh, uh, an attempt to kind of take on the whole of Southern California culture, I think Esther McCoy becomes important for all sorts of reasons, not least of which is um, her determination that an entire career, a life indeed, could be made writing about, um, about architecture in and around uh, Los Angeles, and we will come back, uh, we'll come back to Esther. Um, at this point, uh, she is also writing, of course, for Arts and Architecture magazine, um, the journal radically remade, reinvented by its editor, John Intenza, shown with Charles and Ray Eames here, uh, and of course, the uh, sponsor of the, of the hugely influential case study program. But I want to call your attention this morning to another piece that was outside of the case study program. Um, like many shelter journals then and now, uh, Arts and Architecture um, was largely enthusiastic, even promotional in its tone and outlook. Um, it did not publish um, uh, um, uh, regular criticism uh, to the degree that we would might expect as contemporary readers looking back at it. Um, but it did break from that approach from time to time to publish um, real criticism. And one memorable example, which I think is timely given plans at the LA County Museum, um, uh, occurred in 1965 when Intenza himself um, published this editorial slamming William Pereira's new campus for LACMA on Wilshire Boulevard. Um, and the, the entire piece, in fact, is sort of advertised as a departure, uh, in essence, uh, suggesting that the building is so bad, uh, so egregious that, um, that uh, arts and architecture needs to break from its typical um, habit of not publishing critical pieces to tell its readers about the many disappointments of this project. Um, if you look at that paragraph in the middle there, um, uh, the, the photographs of the museum are accompanied by an analysis which does not pretend to be exhaustive and merely indicates those faults we believe to be inexcusable in an architect of Mr. Pereira's experience and stature, and it sort of goes downhill from there. Um, uh, it is worth mentioning also the role that the, uh, in terms of promotion, uh, th that the LA Times Home Magazine was playing in this period, um, and it, it was um, uh, generally positive in coverage, but it's also, I think, worth, uh, worth saying that it was really, uh, as, as suggested by this image, trying to cover uh, the most interesting, innovative, and experimental work um, of, the, of the period, um, and was also um, publishing um, uh, figures like Esther McCoy, whose byline appeared quite regularly in that magazine, and also, um, as in this clip, Jean Murray Bangs, who was married to the architect Harwell Hamilton Harris and was a key uh, 
um, figure writing um, both what we would think of as reported pieces on architecture and criticism um, in this period, and this is from a spread, uh, which is sort of at the beginning of the revival of interest in, in green and green, um, titled Los Angeles Know Thyself. Um, um, and if we're talking about the mid-1960s, uh, I think one of the very most important um, pieces um, is published in 1965, actually in Prospecta, um, the Yale Journal of Architecture, um, edited by young Robert A.M. Stern uh, in the issue Prospecta 910 in 1965, um, which also includes excerpts from Complexity and Contradiction, really an amazing collection of essays. There is uh, what I think still holds up as one of the great pieces ever written about Southern California architecture and urbanism, Charles Moore's You Have to Pay for the Public Life, which then became the title of his um, collected essays. Um, and um, one of the disappointments for me of the, of the Pacific Standard Time series, in fact, is that there's not a show dedicated to Charles Moore. I think his work is really ripe for a kind of reappraisal. There are a lot of young architects I know who are really looking um, in, in great earnest at this work, in particular his writing. I think we can debate how well the architecture holds up, uh, but his criticism and his writing and his guidebook of Los Angeles architecture published in the 1980s, which we'll get to in a second also, um, holds up remarkably well. And in You Have to Pay for the Public Life, um, Charles Moore is really uh, um, making, I think, a really early and brilliant uh, argument about the, um, about themed, what we now call themed architecture and the migration of civic space in many ways from the public to the private realm. And he really identifies, without much irony, Disneyland as the, the most important part of the built environment of the Los Angeles of the, of, and the Southern California of the 1960s. Um, but this is around the time also that, that more and more uh, critics from, uh, from other cities are beginning to think about what Los Angeles represents as it goes through in the 1960s, another one of its great growth uh, spurts. Um, and so this is actually a, a, um, um, a, an essay by Alan Temko, who of course was the architecture critic at the, at the San Francisco Chronicle um, for many years, um, writing about what is... Uh, perennially, of course, referred to as, as it is here, the problem of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, this is actually a, 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 a journal and a piece that I found in, in, in my first little dip into the Ada Louise Huxtable archive. So it was a piece that she was looking at as she was um, thinking about Los Angeles. Um, and it's from um, uh, 1966, uh, just the year after the Charles Moore um, essay appears, and then it, it's you know it's worth talking a little bit about what's happening outside of uh, criticism proper. Of course, in this period, you have um, the publication of, of Ed Ruscha's "Every Building on the Sunset Strip," um, also in 1966, um, and I think the beginning of a kind of um, attempt um, in uh, in in the art world, um, which begins to filter into architecture as well, an attempt to see and appreciate Los Angeles for what it is. Um, and to really take a kind of clear eye, even deadpan, uh, look at the city and the built environment. And as I mentioned, that, um, that approach is also seen um, in the architecture of the period. The top left is, is um, Frank Gehry's Danziger uh, studio on Melrose from that same exact period, 1965-66. Um, and the bottom right um, um, is David Hockney's, it's a drawing from 1967 um, called simply Los Angeles. Um, and you can see the affinity there and also back to, um, you know, the, the kind of architecture that Ed Ruscha was looking at and cataloging. And, and by um, the late 1960s, the, the, there begins to be, as you can see from this uh, publication of the, of the uh, Southern California AA, a kind of attempt to uh, put that work in some kind of um, critical context. Um, in this period, of course, um, uh, Denise Scott Brown arrives in Los Angeles, begins teaching at UCLA, and in fact is looking, before uh, she and Robert Venturi go to Las Vegas, is looking uh, very closely at Los Angeles, um, and uh, um, eventually find the, the two find a kind of more distilled uh, version of the cityscape they hope to analyze in Las Vegas, but I think um, 
one could uh, could argue that that some of those first ideas are born as Denise Scott Brown is is looking at and 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 teaching about uh, Los Angeles. And of course, I'll I'll leave most of the Rainer Banham uh, talk to Tony. But it's this period when Rainer Banham first begins to make uh, visits to uh, uh, Southern California um, and and think about what will become his uh, 1971 book, Los Angeles, The Architecture of Four Ecologies. Um, uh, a couple of really quick points on Banham. Um, uh, he is, of course, a dedicated cyclist um, before he gets to LA, and here he is um, riding his Bickerton folding bike um, in the Mojave, um, uh, who ditches the bike and learns to drive, as he puts it so famously in the book, in order to read Los Angeles um, uh, in the original and uh, before long, he is um, going native, as it were, um, posing at the top um, in, uh, at the, uh, against a kind of mural, photo mural at the John Muir School in Santa Monica, and uh, um, uh, looking at himself in the rearview mirror, of course. Um, and there, the, the cover of um, uh, Four Ecologies, um, published in, um, in 1971. Um, but remember that headline uh, um, about um, uh, from the 1930s about Moro Mayo. There are always um, locals, um, and there is always some kind of backlash. In this case, a backlash to the, the optimism and the positivity of Banham's book, in the form of um, a review by a, a very young Peter Plagans, who went on to become a well-known has gone on, of course, to become a well-known art critic, an LA native, um, uh, reviewed uh, Four Ecologies for Art Forum, uh, and called Bannum um, a, a chic debunker of current anti-LA mythology, who finds that LA is really a groovy place in spite of its evils, and often because of them, if you know how to look at it right. And he concluded in that review that the biggest problem with Banham's praise for Los Angeles was that it might, quote, have a trickle-down effect, i.e., the hacks who do shopping centers, Hawaiian restaurants, and savings and loans, the dried-up civil servants in the division of highways, and the legions of showbiz fringes, fringes excuse me, will sleep a little easier and work a little harder now that their enterprises have been authenticated. Uh, and uh, he was just getting warmed up at that point. Um, uh, in a more humane society where Banham's doctrines would be measured against the subdividers' rape of the land and the lead particles in the little kid's lungs, the author might be stood up against a wall and shot. Um, and when I was uh, doing the Reading LA project, uh, I, I met, got to know Peter when I was in New York long ago. Um, and so I sent him an email to ask what he recalled about writing that piece. Um, and he sent an email that said, from what I gather on Google, the years have made me the bad guy, a young provincial anti-intellectual offended local nipping at the feet of the big time world traveler architecture critic. I, th I still think, he wrote me in that email, I was right that A, Bannum was another of those sun-loving Brits found in droves in the movie business who had an appreciation of Southern California that was only a half step up from Midwestern tourists at Disneyland. And his feelings have not softened much, as you could tell. Um, uh, and B, the root of the matter in the early 1970s was, as the last line of my piece said, the fashionable son of a bitch doesn't have to live here. <laughs> Meaning, as Plagans went on, he didn't have to suffer primarily the air, which was toxic to a degree younger people don't remember. Everything Banham liked about LA, googie architecture, wide freeways, going everywhere in a car, pop culture, almost the only culture, I thought was part of the problem. Um, and it's at this point in the early 1970s that the LA Times um, uh, gets its first architecture critic, um, John Pastier, shown here in, um, I apologize for the grainy footage from an appearance at SciArc um, in the mid-1970s, which is worth finding on the SciArc. SciArc has a terrific, um, uh, terrific media archive, I think in part funded by the Getty, and it's uh, worth um, seeking out this little clip of John Pastier who talks about just having been thrown out of the Times, in fact, 
um, um, and, and is at the end of his, uh, his tenure there um, in 1975. And, and by, the 19, by the late 1970s, he's succeeded by John Dreyfus, um, son of the industrial designer Henry Dreyfus. Um, and John Dreyfus's close relationship with and promotion of the work of the young LA architects of that period, who would go on to be uh, come known as the LA School and by other names, um, uh, Gary, Tom Main, Michael Rotundi, Eric Moss, Fred Fisher, and others, is at the center of the, as many of you know, uh, the PSTP architecture show at SciArc at Confederacy of Heretics. Um, and in fact, um, John Dreyfus's role uh, in writing about, in exploring, and promoting that work is really um, uh, a central part of that show. And in fact, uh, this sort of introductory review to uh, the exhibitions that the show uh, documents is, is included as a kind of um, uh, artifact uh, slash wall text um, in the show. Um, and there is, by this point, as the 70s turn into the 80s, a real uh, diversity of coverage uh, and criticism uh, with um, more and more uh, critics from New York and even, as this uh, Domus cover suggests, um, from Europe making the trip to Los Angeles um, to write, uh, as this uh, uh, cover package uh, did, about the young architects of California. This is from, uh, from early 1980. Um, uh, another real discovery for me of, um, of the Reading LA project was Richard Meltzer, who many of you may know as a rock critic, really one of the writers who invented rock criticism in the 1970s and 80s, um, who as a kind of side uh, hobby published um, uh, essays in LA Weekly chronicling what he called the ugliest buildings in Los Angeles. Um, and those essays were uh, compiled into a very short book, which, as I wrote um, in my essay on it, was sort of bound like one of those PTA um, uh, recipe uh, books um, uh, with the black plastic binding. Um, again, more of a pamphlet than a book, um, and I think that's exactly how uh, Meltzer uh, wanted it. Um, uh, and there's also uh, Leonard Korn's wet magazine of gourmet bathing, as he called it, um, uh, which is uh, featured in Sylvia Levin's uh, uh, really terrific show at the uh, Mack Center at the Schindler House about art and architecture in the 1970s, um, uh, which was in some ways incidentally became you know, a, a journal about art and architecture and culture in LA uh, indirectly. Um, and another discovery for me, David Brodsley's really terrific and underappreciated clear-eyed study of the LA freeway uh, from 1981. And then as I mentioned, 1984, there is Charles Moore's new and really bracing architectural uh, guidebook to the city, uh, the city observed, Los Angeles, um, in some ways a rejoinder to, I think by that point, what was becoming some of the predictability and even stuffiness of the Gebhardt in winter. Um, guide, which was which had very little patience for anything um, built after the modern period. Um, uh, Moore, of course, was enthusiastic not just about Disneyland, but all kinds of vernacular and other architecture that was either not included or dismissed in the Gebhardt and Winter book in, in its various editions. Um, uh, and this is part of what um, Moore wrote about Los Angeles. Unlike most cities, he wrote, Los Angeles is not organized as a set of places or neighborhoods. It is so big that it must be seen for the most part as a set of very long streets or freeways or rides. And really the book is organized as a series of rides. Um, and the places of interest as events along the way. Of course, there is some architecture in Eden, but it hardly ever carries the story, is how Charles Moore put it. Um, uh, his enthusiasm, of course, and this is, uh, as you can see, uh, the, the frequent back and forth between enthusiasm and, and deep cynicism. Uh, Moore's enthusiasm for the city and the region is, is countered uh, just six years later uh, with the publication of, uh, of City of Courts, Mike Davis's um, real broadside uh, against the city and its uh, sort of legacy of boosterism. Um, uh, but I think one way that this book stood out for me in, my, in the Reading LA project that I did was um, that it really was interested in the same way that McWilliams and Bannum were uh, interested in their books, were interested in covering you know, the whole city, the whole region, tackling the whole 
subject of Los Angeles and its built environment. Uh, now a staple of, uh, of course, this book of a, a few thousand college syllabi. Um, and, and on rereading, I found it um, shamelessly hyperbolic and overwritten and, and I think in desperate need of some editing, but also really continuing to stand as with uh, Mick Williams and Bannum as one of the most important takes on LA in looking at what he called uh, the spatial apartheid um, uh, of a gated community urbanism in Southern California, what he also called a new class war at the level of the built environment in this, um, in this uh, landscape of uh, more and more exclusion. Um, uh, and then, you know, Mike Davis's a really dark thesis is, of course, redeemed in many ways or is seen, is seen to be redeemed by the riots that break out in shortly thereafter. Uh, and then um, after the riots take place, we begin to see uh, responses to them. And in fact, Charles Jenks, um, in writing uh, his book, Heteropolis, which also I think holds up rather well as a study of the LA school and their early work, um, is beginning to grapple uh, as the subhead, which you can barely read there, um, suggests uh, with the kind of legacy of the riots and what that means for architecture, culture, the built environment um, in Los Angeles. And the, the riots also begin to figure in other takes, uh, not of course architecture criticism, but I think worth mentioning. Anna Devere Smith's great um, stage production, uh, Twilight, Los Angeles, 1992, uh, which looks at some of the very same issues uh, from a completely different um, uh, perspective. Um, and it's that uh, sort of grappling with the legacy of uh, that uprising, those riots, that really begins to color uh, much of the discussion in the 1990s. And we also have the LA Forum um, emerging um, in this period, and um, uh, one of its leading figures, Aaron Betsky, also writing criticism for the LA Times. Um, and you have, um, uh, subsequently, um, uh, uh, critics from New York, Paul Goldberger, uh, and then his uh, successor at the New York Times, Herbert Mouchamp, coming on regular trips to Los Angeles. This is one of Herbert's really memorable pieces about staying at the Shangri-La Hotel in Santa Monica and being bounced out of bed uh, unceremoniously by, um, uh, by an earthquake. Um, and in fact, um, uh, I don't have a pointer here, but if you look at, uh, I guess, the fourth, uh, the fourth paragraph there the, at the end of that graph, um, as he puts it, and for many architecture critics today, the entire city of Los Angeles is Shangri-La home to some of the most gifted architects now practicing, and that um, uh, became the sort of conventional wisdom of particularly New York critics writing in that period. Um, Goldberger uh, and Mouchamp certainly among them. Um, uh, and the, the position of, of, of critic at the LA Times is really solidified uh, by, by Nikolai um, uh, Arusov, who um, after spending uh, nearly a decade at the Times is hired by the New York Times and takes his kind of take um, and support for, in many ways, LA architecture um, to the East Coast, uh, where I think you could argue that his uh, support, critical support for Tom Main and Morphosis is really crucial in helping Maine win the, win, ultimately win the Pritzker Prize. Um, and so, um, in closing, just a, a couple more images. Um, wh where does that all um, leave us now? I think um, we're in a very, um, we're in a really fascinating period um, um, that is being framed in some ways by these Pacific Standard Time shows, um, uh, but also by other efforts um, to sort of take the uh, 20th century uh, modernist history of Los Angeles um, to take the period when Los Angeles was really um, um, inventing the future in all sorts of um, industries and areas, not, not least of which was architecture, of course, um, and putting some of those um, in historical settings, slipping them uh, some of that work under glass, 
uh, or putting it as in the case of the space shuttle, parading it through the streets, bringing it um, in from LAX and putting it in uh, on view at the California Science Center. Um, and, and that um, was not the only um, similar event. I, th I, I think uh, the, um, the effort, um, as, as Wendy Kaplan well knows, to put the, um, the living room, to recreate the, the living room of the Eames House inside the Resnick Pavilion at LACMA, uh, sort of create sort of a, um, a replica of it, but then fill it, importantly, with the actual um, with the actual objects from the Eames' um, uh, living room and, and make it in some ways the centerpiece of a show uh, on modern design in California um, was, was part of that same effort as um, um, I've written was the effort at UCLA to take the room um, uh, on the UCLA campus where one of the first, or the first uh, message um, uh, according to UCLA, um, was sent to the Stanford Research Institute, uh, uh, the first sort of um, internet uh, communication, um, uh, that this room um, had been, um, in, in Bolter Hall, had been much changed over the intervening years since that message was sent in the fall of 1969. Um, and a young graduate student began a campaign to um, to kind of turn it uh, back the way that it was and turn it into a kind of shrine to the invention of the internet. Um, and with um, contributions from Mark Cuban and Eric Schmidt from Google um, and consulting with um, um, folks at the Fowler Museum, UCLA has in fact um, done that, um, making the room look uh, uh, exactly as it did in 1969 uh, to match uh, photographs from the period. Um, I would put in that in, in that same category. Um, so the uh, my sort of takeaway from that year-long project, where I read what ultimately ended up being 27 nonfiction titles about LA, uh, was that first there is a, a much richer uh, literature on architecture and urbanism here than I think even uh, Angelinos ourselves. Uh, tend to acknowledge, and many of the kind of books in a more minor key, um, I think, deserve a lot more attention. I would, I would mention particularly uh, D.J. Waldy's uh, uh, memoir, Holy Land, about Lakewood, which I'm sure many of you know. Uh, also, uh, William McClung's uh, uh, book, Landscapes of Desire, about the kind of creation of Anglo culture, I think is a, a book that deserves to be better known. Uh, as does uh, uh, Seshu Foster's uh, poem, City Terrace uh, Field Manual, which I did not include in the project because I was not looking at poetry or fiction, but another one of those uh, shorter books or, or books in a more minor key uh, that deserve to be better known. Um, but really, the ones that stood out, as I mentioned, were the ones that were willing to take on this whole uh, complex and gigantic subject, the books that were really trying to swallow L.A., whole, and indeed that was what I think I, I most admired about, admire about the Overdrive show, is a similar attempt to really tell the entire story as complicated and as difficult as it is to hit all of those points. Um, but really it's McWilliams and Bannum and Mike Davis uh, that stood out. And now that we're t talking um, also about criticism, um, I would say um, uh, Charles Moore, as I mentioned, deserves to be uh, in in that first order, as of course, um, as of course does Esther McCoy, um, whom Bannum called um, uh, quite accurately the mother of us all when it comes to writing uh, criticism and about architecture in Southern California. Thank you very much. Thank you.